Good evening, I'm Janella Massa. Ian is away. Tonight, Russia signals a shift in the war. What could it mean for millions of Ukrainians? People's lives are turned upside down. They have to pick up the pieces of their lives and start anew in a new place. Plus, inside a Canadian clinic on the Ukraine-Poland border, why they just had to come and help. Also, worries about a spring COVID wave. It's increasing at a, at a rate that um, we haven't really seen before in the pandemic. And why the World Health Organization put Canada's homegrown vaccine on hold. Plus, BC offers a free tank of gas to help with sky-high prices at the pump. $110 to offset it, that's it. And after more than 90 years of magic Oscar moments, who's still watching? Oh my God. <laughs> Can they win back viewers? This is The National. On a day when devastating new details are emerging from Ukraine about just how deadly the fighting there has been, Russia appears to be signaling its war plan is shifting and narrowing, focusing in on the Donbass region in eastern Ukraine. It's still unclear what that could mean for other areas of the country. In the meantime, as Susan Ormiston shows us, the attacks aren't letting up and the horror is growing. A theater in Mariupol, which served as a bomb shelter, may be the worst mass casualty site so far in this war. 300 people die in the Russian airstrike, March 16th, say city officials. Mariupol appears colorless. It hides horrors. UN monitors say one mass grave may hold 200 bodies. On both sides, troops are slogging into month two of this war with small gains and losses. Today, a Russian colonel general said phase one of the military operation was mostly complete and it would focus its core efforts on the liberation of the Donbass region, where Ukrainian and Russian-backed forces have been fighting since 2014. Russia may be signaling a scaled-back war plan, say Western analysts. Ukraine says it pushed back Russian troops east of Kyiv, blocking off one route to the capital. But in Kharkiv, a Russian rocket attack terrified people lined up for humanitarian aid. And artillery strikes set off huge fires, one at a medical facility. In Nikolaev, Tatiana returned to her broken home. She says she'll stay in the city. We'll fight to the end as best we can, some with weapons and some with moral support. Ukraine wants more than that from the U.S. and NATO. Thank you very, very much for all you do. President Biden visited U.S. soldiers on a Polish military base close to Ukraine's border, part of NATO's mission. We're in the midst of, and I don't want to sound too philosophic here, but you're in the midst of a fight between democracies and, 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 and oligarchs. Biden has underscored on this European trip a key strategy is to keep these NATO members unified. Tomorrow in Warsaw, he'll meet some Ukrainian refugees and deliver what the White House is calling a major address on the conflict. Susan Ormiston, CBC News, Lviv. Well, one indication of how the war is going for Russia, the staggering estimates of the losses on its side. They've taken enormous casualties in the ranks. Uh, we think that the number is at least uh, twice that of what the United States suffered in 20 years of, of tough fighting in Iraq. Coming up a little later, my conversation with retired U.S. General David Petraeus about where things stand in the war now and what Putin might do next. Meanwhile, a team of Canadian medics is treating Ukrainians making their way to Poland. They're set up just inside the western border of Ukraine, ready with supplies. But as Slima Shivji shows us, sometimes the Ukrainians they're encountering just need a shoulder to lean on. They come in surge, streaming towards the border with Poland, exhaustion written on their faces. Tucked into the corner beside a soup kitchen, a field clinic staffed by Canadians, ready to spring into action. The doctors and nurse are volunteering their time in a war zone. 
This woman spent two days trying to make it here, a 1,200 kilometer journey from Donetsk. Probe on her. She says she's dizzy, dehydrated, and so tired. In the end, she's not in need of medical care, just perhaps some comfort. The team understands, says this ER doctor from Vancouver. People's lives are turned upside down. They have to pick up the pieces of their lives and start anew in a new place. The work here is stop and start. Happy birthday to you. But even on the doctor's birthday, his last 12-hour shift before heading back home... There's nowhere else I'd rather be. The Canadian Medical Assistant Teams, an NGO, is used to working in disaster zones after earthquakes and hurricanes, not conflict zones. And thankfully, we are well away from the conflict zone, like the, the danger area per se, but it can change tomorrow and it moves fast. And Russian troops just uh, came with the guns. For Katya Trusova, uh, much too fast. The team's uh, translator traveled from Texas to help, but she's originally from Kherson in southern Ukraine and her mother is stuck there. She walks every day six kilometers to get water. Unable to escape the city under Russian control. It just destroyed completely, you know. The videos her mother sends are devastating. This one of a shopping centre Trusova knows well, now in ruins. The work she does here with the Canadians is personal. Whatever how I can be useful, I will do my part. But I will tell you that to be like especially in Ukrainian territory, it felt so, so, so good, you know. To be under the same skies as her mother, as close as she can get. When there's a lull... The women manning the food stall fill the void. Pent-up emotion spills over as they belt out Ukraine's national anthem. And the doctors volunteering their time capture the memories, a reminder of the help that's sorely needed. Salima Shivji, CBC News, at Ukraine's border with Poland. Well, three more Ukrainian children with cancer have, arri have arrived at SickKids Hospital in Toronto. None of this would be possible without the work of truly remarkable clinical teams in Western Ukraine and Poland. With these latest arrivals from Poland, there are now five child cancer patients from Ukraine being treated at SickKids. Well, to the COVID story now, which has been one of relief for many Canadians recently. With high vaccination rates and the latest wave in the rearview mirror, many provinces have lifted nearly all restrictions. But take a look at what's happening in Europe. New infections are surging on the rise in many countries and persistently high in others. The World Health Organization says public health restrictions were lifted too quickly. And now experts believe parts of Canada could be on the verge of another wave of infections. But whether it's a big surge or a small ripple is what's uncertain. And as Thomas Dagla explains, scientists are now looking to wastewater for clues. As mask mandates have fallen, there's growing evidence COVID cases are rising. Experts warned the virus would hit back now in pockets of the country. It's, it's increasing at a, at a rate that um, we haven't really seen before in the pandemic. Without widespread testing, experts are analyzing wastewater to gauge how widely COVID is circulating. Tyson Graber focuses on Ottawa, and what he's seeing is not good. In the next week or so, um, we're going to see an increase in hospitalizations commensurate with the increase in wastewater signal. Across Ontario, wastewater analysis shows COVID leveling off through much of February, then steadily picking up again in recent days. Premier Doug Ford was asked whether another surge would mean a return to restrictions. Let's continue making sure that we move forward in a cautious way. And, you know, let, let's talk about that if, God forbid, that ever happens uh, at the time. In Quebec, a subvariant of Omicron is now driving most infections. There's some room for a new variant like BA2 to uh, sweep across and cause uh, a wave of increased uh, disease. Just consider what happened at McGill University. With COVID this week striking so many students, the school had nowhere left for those living on campus to isolate. I would say probably like 30 to 40 percent of the building is positive right now. Um, that number might have went up since this morning. And what about those more vulnerable? Kirby Gaiman's father, Clark, was being treated for an unrelated condition in February. He caught COVID in hospital and died. That's actually pretty scary, um, knowing that what killed my dad is, is still out there and still open, and now we know less about it. There's less testing available now and more decisions left up to each individual, complicating predictions 
for what happens next. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Toronto. Okay, let's bring in Dr. Isaac Bogotch to dive in a little deeper. Uh, Dr. Bogotch, how are you feeling about the coming weeks and months with so many provinces essentially going back to normal? Yeah, I mean, it's pretty clear that when we look at the wastewater surveillance, the, the Omicron is, is on the rise, unfortunately, in many parts of Canada. We are going to see a rise in cases. It's hard to quantify because we're not really doing a lot of testing at the community level. And, you know, unfortunately, we're going to see a bump in hospitalizations as well. And that's... Uh, it's really sad. You know, we all want this to be over, but of course it's not over. I think we still have to be very cautious, especially in the weeks ahead. It's not quite clear how big this wave is going to be, but it is clear that we are going to have a wave. Okay. And, you know, eventually, as you say, we'll have that wave, but the question becomes, uh, will hospitals and, and healthcare be able to handle it this time around? What's that tipping point for you and, and what can we do to try to mitigate it? You know, it's, it's not quite clear because we haven't really done anything differently. We still have limited health care capacity. We still have, uh, you know, uh, significant uh, uh, challenges with staffing and health care. You know, this wave might not be as big as prior waves. But again, there's still a lot of uncertainty in the road that lies ahead. I think we should still be cautious. Obviously, masking is, is helpful. It's not perfect, but it's helpful. And I think many people are appropriately continuing to mask. And again, if people haven't received dose one, dose two, or dose three of the vaccine, now is uh, just as good a time as any, and in fact, a perfect time to receive any doses that remain uh, to, be, to be received by people that are eligible. So masking, vaccination, and, uh, you know, I think we, we'll get through this like we've got through the, the last few, but uh, it's just frustrating to see this again happen in the spring. All right, Dr. Isaac Bogosh, thanks so much. My pleasure. Meanwhile, a major snag in Canada's plan to export a COVID vaccine developed in Quebec. It's the first plant-based vaccine, but as Christine Birak shows us, because there's tobacco money behind it, getting approval is tricky. At least there's one country ready for Canada's homegrown COVID vaccine. It will be soon available to Canadians. That's a good thing. The bad thing is, right now, it can't easily be donated to countries in need. The World Health Organization says Medicago's vaccine has so far not been accepted because of the linkage with the tobacco industry. When Medicago decided to uh, let Philip Morris invest uh, in the company, they fully knew the, uh, the, the position of WHO. Philip Morris holds a 21% stake in Medicago. The Quebec-based company uses tobacco plants to grow virus-like particles that get extracted and used in its vaccine. Experts say the vaccine safety and efficacy isn't the problem. It's allowing a cigarette company to profit. Tobacco is still one of the most important killer annually for something that is totally preventable. You have to be very thoughtful about where you draw these lines. Other experts insist turning down an effective COVID vaccine could cost lives, adding investments from companies selling alcohol and other harmful products are accepted. In the same way that like GPS can be used to guide missiles, you know, we all also use it for Google Maps in our car. The WHO has approved other drugs with tobacco ties, including an Ebola treatment in 2014. The health minister insists the government doesn't regret investing millions in Medicago. There are other avenues that we can use uh, to make sure that we are heading in the right direction. One of those avenues may include Health Canada sharing its safety and efficacy review of Medicago's vaccine directly with individual countries, effectively bypassing the World Health Organization and offering up the shots. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. Ottawa is giving provinces $2 billion to help them clear healthcare surgical backlogs caused by the pandemic. Too many of our fellow citizens have suffered and are still suffering this ordeal. It follows last year's $4 billion top-up to the federal health transfer. To Alberta now, where after a week of controversy and backlash, Premier Jason Kenney appeared today with a message for his critics. He defended his leadership, and as Kyle Bax reports, he also refused to apologize for calling some of his opponents lunatics. At a funding announcement this afternoon for an air ambulance service, the embattled premier facing a whirlwind of questions about his future. Is your heart still in this? Oh, very much. 
Voting on Jason Kenney's leadership is set to get underway early next month. Instead of an in-person vote, this week the UCP abruptly switched to a mail-in ballot. So what the board, uh, the elected board of the UCP has done is to uh, enfranchise every single member, allowing them to vote from the convenience of their kitchen table uh, in a, a, a safe, uh, responsible way with all sorts of uh, oversights and, and legal checks. Kenny is facing a revolt from UCP leadership, his own caucus, and party members. And you have shaken Albertans' trust in the UCP. Recently elected MLA and Kenny's most vocal political rival, Brian Jean, called the shift to mail-in ballots a formula for fraud and cheating. And the only thing and the only option that remains is to just move forward with the leadership contest. Under pressure to resign, this week Kenny was recorded telling caucus staff how close he came to quitting. But he says he wants to stay on to stop the party falling into what he says are the wrong hands. CBC News obtained audio of the Premier. The lunatics are trying to take over the asylum. And I'm not going to let them. He doubled down on that message today. We have people involved in this leadership uh, review campaign who organized a tiki torch rally at the legislature using explicitly images from the uh, neo-Nazi rally in Charlottesville, Virginia. The voting may begin soon, but the party says the results won't be known until mid-May. Kyle Bax, CBC News, Calgary. In British Columbia, some relief is on the way for drivers dealing with the highest gas prices in Canada. That province says it's rolling out a one-time rebate to help ease the financial pain. Lindsay Duncombe has the reaction from drivers feeling the squeeze. Gas prices were high in Vancouver before the war in Ukraine. Now they're soaring. But the government's plan to provide relief is being met with a shrug. Why bother? I mean, really? I'd rather them give the money to, to the people in Ukraine or fighting the war. $110? To offset it, that's it. The province's public insurance corporation, ICBC, will provide each driver with a $110 rebate. Commercial drivers will get $165. The program will cost $395 million in total. Well, I think it's a significant contribution at a very difficult time for drivers. All drivers will get the rebate cash, even if they're wealthy, own an electric vehicle, or don't drive much. It's a little bit disappointing that they just made this across-the-board payment uh, when we know that the, the pain at the pumps is really concentrated among, among low- to moderate-income households. Economists say BC's plan is likely to bring more relief bang for the government buck than what Alberta's doing. Starting April 1st, it will drop the 13 cents a litre provincial tax on gas. But there's nothing stopping gas companies from keeping prices high. In Alberta, gas profits mean more government revenue, so win-win. They're making more money because prices are high, and they can't afford to provide a very large relief. Quebec is broadening relief beyond drivers, providing one-time payments of $500 to every adult making less than $100,000 a year. Gas prices could drop in the next several weeks or months as the international oil market increases supply. In the meantime, drivers endure. It's a very small sacrifice for what they're playing, paying in Ukraine. So, I mean, we're not dying, are we? <laughs> we're still alive. So There may be pain at the pumps, but there's perspective, too. Lindsay Duncombe, CBC News, Vancouver. Tonight, two sexual assault survivors are sharing their stories and a fight for justice that's taken three decades. I need to do this. I need to find my closure. I need to find my strength. I need to take my power back. What they said today directly to the man who attacked them. Plus, the desperate reality inside a Ukrainian city under siege. When you need to loot shops to make your food, it was the, it was the worst for me. And after a month of war, we go beyond the headlines with the former director of the CIA. What happens if Putin feels he's backed into a corner? But next, as the Oscars try to win back viewers, Eli Glasner joins us from the red carpet. That's in just two minutes. Well, Sunday is Oscar night. Maybe you'll be tuning in, but if not, you'd be one of the growing number of people sitting them out. 
Last year, viewership hit an all-time low. Let's bring in our Eli Glasner. He's definitely watching, and he is in Los Angeles. Eli, what is the biggest challenge facing the Oscars? Well, as you said, it's ratings and relevance. This show, this award that so many filmmakers dream of receiving is just not getting enough eyeballs. Many of the biggest pictures aren't connecting with audiences in a meaningful way, and that's led to some big changes inside the Academy as they try and recapture some of those golden Oscar moments. And the Oscar goes to Halle Berry and Monsters Ball. For 93 years, the Oscars have given us moments of joy, tears, oh my God. <laughs> and high drama. Moonlight, you guys won Best Picture. But now the Academy faces its biggest crisis. Last year, only 10.4 million people tuned in to watch Nomadland win Best Picture, a historic low continuing a downward trend. Part of the problem? These are the 10 highest grossing films of 2021, superheroes and sequels. And these are the very different Oscar Best Picture nominees. On this movie... Canadian Sean Levy is the director of the Oscar-nominated, for visual effects, smash hit Free Guy. He's tired of blockbusters being ignored. I think it's incomprehensible. I feel like, why in the world would movies get penalized for popularity? Because the level of craft in a movie like No Way Home is exceptional. The level of craft in a movie like Free Guy, we're genuinely proud of. To lure viewers this year, the Academy added a fan favorite award where fans can vote on Twitter, which means movies like Camila Cabello's Cinderella could get Oscar attention. While at the same time, Oscar producers booted eight categories, many featuring Canadian nominees, out of the live broadcast. It's uncomfortable because nobody wants to think they're a second-class citizen. Canadian director Denny Villeneuve's film Dune received 10 nominations. He's arriving early for the part of the show viewers won't see. I'm against the idea, but I will go there. I'll be sitting in this, the, the room uh, before 4 p.m., so I'll be, I will be there for cheering for my, my peers. Everyone <laughs> believes that Dune will win this year. But the ratings problem is bigger than the Oscars. It's a live TV problem. It's a live TV broadcast problem. Um, you know, basically, if you're not the Super Bowl, or uh, some other kind of major live sporting event, you're, you've been really suffering. And to address that problem, Oscar producers are pulling out all the stops, inviting everyone from Beyonce to the skateboarder, Tony Hawk, even including the first live performance of the smash hit, We Don't Talk About Bruno, all an effort to try and recapture some of those award-winning Oscar ratings. All right, CBC's Eli Glasner in LA. After the break, we're returning to Russia's war in Ukraine with a former director of the CIA. This is a very substantial toll, again, on their leaders, uh, and it has mounted with every passing day. Retired U.S. General David Petraeus on how it could end and what he thinks Putin could do next. And later, a little boy gets his moment with his hockey heroes. We'll be right back. The aid lines stretch on in the Ukrainian city of Mariupol. This aid being handed out by Russia after it spent weeks relentlessly bombing the city, cutting off critical supply lines. When Russia invaded Ukraine, Mariupol was home to about 400,000 people. At least three quarters have fled, taking with them personal horror stories of suffering and survival. They thought that maybe if no one is safe, comes to save us. Maybe the world just doesn't know about the situation. These twins so lived through two weeks of attacks, but when the shelling cut them off from water, they made a daring escape, hitching a ride with strangers. I don't know where we go in. I don't know how, how much time it will take, but I was happy that I'm, I'm in a car. I'm in, I'm all, we are all is with our, our family. Now they're talking about what it took to stay alive. The first day when we lost uh, gas, people were, you know, people were taking out uh, their furniture. They were cutting trees in the next days. You can live without your phone. It's okay. You can live without internet. But when you need to loot 
shops for uh, to to find something to make fire to make your food it was the it was the worst for me in desperation they searched elsewhere for supplies too i remember when i was in those uh, apartment of our friends i felt like see we were checking uh, every shelf if they have something and i was happy oh my god i found the candle oh my god i found the uh, uh, rice when we went got out me and my family, all of us, we were crying about that food that is left closed in our apartment and our neighbors maybe would need that. We just didn't have time to give it to someone. Tens of thousands of people are believed to remain in the city. Well, despite the devastating toll Russia's attacks have taken on civilians, its forces have failed to gain crucial ground on the battlefield. Retired four-star general David Petraeus is thought to have revolutionized the way the United States fights wars. He commanded U.S. forces in wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and also served as director of the Central Intelligence Agency under former U.S. President Barack Obama. We spoke earlier today. General Petraeus, the Russian officials today saying the first stage of their operation is complete and now they can focus on their main goal which is to to liberate the donbass what do you make of that is this could this be taken as sort of a climb down by russia i think it is it's an extraordinary rationalization given that the most important objective of the operation was to take the capital topple the government and install a pro-russian president in in replace of uh president Zelensky, of course uh, they obviously have been stopped cold outside Kyiv. Uh, in fact, the Ukrainians have been conducting local counterattacks uh, to the west and to the east. Uh, they still have not yet encircled Kharkiv. Uh, it's only in the south where they have had some modicum of success, most significantly, of course, in encircling Mariupol, the very important port city uh, that is just to the west of the Donbass. And they have, in, in, in fact, pushed out somewhat from the separatist controlled areas to, to try to approach their objective, try to achieve the control of all of the two oblasts of Donetsk and Luhansk, uh, the, the so-called Donbass. But they'll still have a lot more work to do there. Now, if Mariupol does fall, and you know, unfortunately, it's probably uh, that it's probably the days are numbered. When that does happen, it may free some Russian forces that could then turn north and east and perhaps uh, help them make the progress that they're trying to achieve now apparently in the Donbass, uh, even as though the other areas, of course, they've really been stopped very short of their objectives. Hmm. And at the same time, you have Ukrainians saying they've killed several top uh, Russian generals. That is uh, unusual. What do you make of that? Well, they've qu killed quite a substantial number. I think the number now is at least seven or more. Uh, in addition to a number of battalion and brigade commanders, so uh, regimental commanders as they are termed. Um, so again, yeah. what's happening here is the command and control system has broken down. Uh, you have a, also young officers who don't have initiative and it's not part of their culture. There's no real professional non-commissioned officer corps as there is in Canada and the United States. So when Senior officers get frustrated, a column stops, they hop out of their vehicle, they go forward, and very capable Ukrainian snipers are picking them off. Uh, this is a very substantial toll, again, on their leaders, uh, and it has mounted with every passing day. Uh, one of the real vulnerabilities that's been, been demonstrated so far, in addition, of course, to the complete failure of their logistical system, uh, not to mention the overall campaign, uh, which has resulted in that rationalization that we started by discussing. And so really the, the big question is here, how does this all play out? How does this end? And, and what happens if Putin feels he's backed into a corner? There's the, the looming elephant in the room of, of chemical and biological warfare. Well, I think there are a number of different dynamics here. Uh, one is obviously the dynamic on the battlefield and how President Putin sees it. Does he at some point get a sense that there's not much more to be achieved? Uh, and maybe if they do achieve control of all of the Donetsk and Luhansk oblasts, plus perhaps a, a land bridge that extends from there to Crimea, 
they can say that, well, this is a great victory. All the other operations were just to keep those forces pinned down outside Kyiv and Kharkiv and Mykolaiv and so forth, uh, having also not gotten to the strategic port city of Odessa. Uh, but maybe that's enough. Uh, he realizes they're not going to achieve any more. He can't replace the casualties. We talked about the casualties to general officers and, and the again, the senior commanders. Uh, they've taken enormous casualties in the ranks. Uh, we think that the number is at least uh, twice that of what the United States suffered in 20 years of, of tough fighting in Iraq. So this is a really extraordinary number of casualties. And if one assumes the number of wounded is several times the number of, of losses, which are at least seven and could be as high as 10,000, uh, then there's just no way that the Russians can replace all of those. Uh, they're scouring the Eastern Military District, uh, Syria, uh, Georgia, uh, even bringing some of their military contractors, the paramilitary, essentially mercenary Wagner group, uh, in to try to plug the gap as well. So that's one dynamic. The other dynamic, of course, is what's taking place in Russia, especially in Moscow, and that's the decimation of the Russian economy, noting that as long as they have coal, gas, and oil, uh, they're still going to be able to generate revenue uh, in, in various ways. But of course, the, the stock market was closed. It opened under very, very constrained circumstances. The ruble is close to worthless. Um, and they've seen over 400 uh, Western companies essentially shut down in Russia or completely leave. They're seeing a hemorrhaging of the best and brightest. The talented are, are leaving. And of course, you have very serious sanctions uh, and the financial freeze uh, of the foreign reserves that has essentially brought their financial system uh, very near collapse as well. So they're in a very difficult situation there, although I should note again that this is a, an economy and a country that has uh, anticipated at least some of the sanctions, but by no means, I think, envisioned the totality of what has been imposed on them. But that's right. another dynamic. And then you have the dynamic of President Zelensky in Kyiv. Uh, and when he sees the daily destruction, further destruction, loss of innocent life, loss of his, uh, some of his forces and so forth, when can all of this come together where each of the leaders will be willing to compromise in a way that was not possible prior to the invasion? And right. that's, I think, when you might be able to get some kind of negotiated settlement uh, the, the outlines of which are starting to appear a bit at this point in time. All right. Lots to watch, and we'll keep watching. Thanks so much, General Petraeus. A pleasure. Thank you. More than 30 years after they were sexually assaulted, two survivors are breaking their silence to share their stories. You want to talk what it, like how police treated you back then? There is literally no worth to our existence. Next, their long fight for justice and the powerful connection it forged between them. Dramatic moments of redemption today for two women in a Toronto courtroom. The women were there to argue that the man who brutally raped them more than 30 years ago should now be locked up for life. And the women only met in recent years, but they now share a bond forged from resilience and determination. They shared their incredible story of justice delayed with CBC News. Shannon Martin has their story as they speak out for the first time. Oh, God, I'm nervous. I know, me too. Uh, I think thank talking you. about this period is nerve-wracking. Nerve There's nerves, anxiety, all wrapped up in three decades worth of pain and trauma, but they come together. Angela English and Nicole Murdoch have waited a long time to tell their story. This is not okay. This is never going to be okay. Nobody should have ever have to wait 36 years that a serial rapist committed this crime and 36 years later, we're getting justice. When we're supposed to be healed already, when we should have already been through should this been process. Done. And now at 60 years old, should I be telling this story? That's right. It's overwhelming for me right now because uh, yeah, I, I'm proud of myself. But at, at the same time, that little girl is, that little voice, it's your fault. You should be ashamed. You shouldn't have been doing what you were doing. And 
you know, so you're still really protecting her right now. Still comes up, right? So I'm taking strength from her because sitting here right now, I still feel that stigma, like that shame. But you have literally nothing to be ashamed of. I know, but it's there. But you did nothing wrong. I know, and I and I know that, but it's still. You know, and then everybody, <laughs> I'm like, oh my goodness, the whole world, or anybody who watches news. And I thought, you know what? I need to do this. I need to find my closure. I need to find my strength. I need to take my power back. Absolutely. So yeah. That's why it. I'm doing it. Yeah. yeah. Done. Yeah. Done feeling ashamed. Their bond, <laughs> undeniable. Even though they've known about each other since the 80s, they only met for the first time last November. That's when their attacker, Raymond Burke, was finally found guilty of the most gruesome crimes. Murdoch was taken at knife point in September 1986 when she was a sex worker. She testified that Burke whipped and repeatedly raped and threatened to kill her. She convinced him to let her go after promising to meet him at the Eaton Centre the next day. Then she went to police. 36 years ago, did what I did, so this would never happen to another person. Burke was arrested and released on bail. One month later, English was taken from downtown. She was just 17, still in high school, and also working the street. Over 24 hours, Burke drove her around. English endured endless abuse before she finally escaped by jumping from his vehicle on the 401 near Bowmanville. Do you want to talk what it, like how police treated you back then? There is literally no worth no compassion. to our existence. Like, it didn't matter. Just street girls, we're, we're nobodies. No matter what circumstance you're in, Nobody deserves what happened to us or to anybody else. You know, I don't. I didn't even understand what was going on at the time. I was traumatized. I'm, you know, young and being transferred from. I think it was five different police cars that I got. Tra all men, by the way, Except in the back seat like a criminal. You reported the assault, but then you didn't hear from police for a, a year. A year. Police told her Burke had taken off to the U.S., where he attacked again was caught and sentenced to 52 years. He was paroled in 2015, deported to Toronto and taken into custody. It would take years to get to this day. At one point, the case was tossed. Burke walked free. The Crown appealed and won. Finally justice. Today, the women walked into court arm in arm, ready to tell how his crimes impacted them. Earlier, they read their statements to us. I'm a survivor. I will never allow you to take any more than you already have taken from me. I won this battle. I see us as heroes, no longer victims of this predator. Justice has no, never been this generous. close. They say the hope is this soon will all be over so they can finally move on. I'm good. I have a good life. My family supports me. I, you know, I'm clean. I have a great job. I live in a beautiful place, so I'm, I'm awesome. So uh, everything that he wanted to destroy, he didn't. He didn't actually made me stronger. United forever. The women find right. comfort in Maybe each like other. Murdoch acts so, much like a big sister, protective. I wouldn't be sitting here if you weren't here. I can tell you that right now. There's no way. I, I don't think I would have enough um, confidence or strength to... Uh, so See, follow through. Like I think that I don't say God. I think that the universe works that way. Like we don't maybe know exactly you were why. You put my life for a reason, girl. Yeah. <laughs> that part. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, I just yeah, I just don't feel like this is it. It's like I don't think that this is the end. I think there's a bigger picture, and I think there's a platform oh. that we stand on that, f and we become advocates. That new bond of sisterhood was displayed during a powerful moment in court. Burke, who is now 69 years old, is standing in the prisoner's box. He turns full body to face the women and stare at them. They're standing at this point with each other. Angela returned that stare and they stood strong. Remember, these women say they are not victims. In fact, Murdoch told us today her statement was a victor statement. As for Burke, he once again found a way to delay court proceedings. He's representing himself. He asked for more time to prepare his sentencing arguments. Court is back in session April 8th.
Shannon Martin, CBC News, Toronto. Well, Indigenous delegates are preparing for historic meetings with the Pope over residential schools. Juanita Taylor spoke with one of them, and here's a preview of some special coverage we'll have in the days ahead. For Adeline Weber, when she speaks to Pope Francis, she says she'll get her strength from her mother. My mother was a really strong, resilient woman. I wouldn't have been able to, to do what she was able to do with all the, her children taken. I always admire her. And when the delegates meet with the Pope, the National will be there. Ian Hannah-Mansing will be hosting our coverage from Rome starting Sunday night. Well, when you think of Texas energy, you probably think of oil, right? Next, why that's changing and the challenges ahead. The push away from fossil fuels is gaining major momentum in an unlikely place. In oil-rich Texas, the renewable energy industry is booming. Tonight, Kyle Bax looks at the shift underway and the lessons learned after last year's massive failure of the Texas electrical grid. In a state known for its oil industry, there's a different source of energy that's kicked into high gear. Towering wind farms and solar fields stretching as far as the eye can see are popping up throughout Texas, now a hotbed for renewables. And the growth didn't slow down, even after last year's failure of the electric grid plunged much of the state into days of darkness and sparked a backlash against clean power. There was some negative press right out of the gate. Leeward Renewable Energy is one of several Canadian-owned companies producing wind and solar power in Texas. Those in the industry say lessons have been learned. That system wasn't as resilient as it needed to be, whether it was renewables, whether it was gas, um, or whether it was the, uh, the fuel suppliers. Uh, so I think it was a call to action. More transmission lines are needed to move power around the state and increase connections to neighboring states to allow Texas to import electricity when needed. Yes, there were a, a good number of wind turbines that went offline, but the primary issues were with the thermal generating plants. In the last 15 years, wind energy has jumped from less than 3% of the state's electricity production to 26% today, surpassing both coal and nuclear. But as renewables ramp up, reliability concerns linger, even after a new rule now requires all power plants to protect against extreme weather. Still, more and more renewable energy developments are underway. And when you look at the economics today, if you, whether you're an investor or a utility, it is the lowest cost option. And renewables could grow even more if President Joe Biden's Build Back Better plan and its clean energy funding are approved. Government incentives definitely help to increase development, but these different types of generation can stand on their own. Texas is already the top wind producer in the country. Now it's on pace to be number one in solar within a few years. Kyle Bax, CBC News, near Sweetwater, Texas. Coming up next, the unlikely MVP of last night's Oilers game. Look at that. We're all cheering for you. Five-year-old Ben's big moment is our moment. Talk about a dream come true for Edmonton Oilers superfan Ben Stelter. Last night, the five-year-old who's battling cancer not only met his favorite players, he got to lace up with the team. Ben's big moment on center ice is our moment. A very special Scotia skater join us, five-year-old Ben Stelter. Before starting his next round of treatment for an aggressive type of brain cancer, Ben suited up for the national anthems, stealing the show in the process. After a pep talk from Captain Connor McDavid, he took to the stance. cheering the Oilers on to a 5-2 victory against the San Jose Sharks. After the game, a celebration in the Oilers' dressing room before facing the press with Zach Hyman. How did you think Zach Hyman played today? Good. I think he plays really good. Thanks, Ben. 
<laughs> this morning, Ben's dad tweeted his son is on cloud nine and he'll never forget the night. And it seems Ben was the team's lucky charm. They uh, beat the Sharks 5-2. Head coach said he definitely touched the players. It was a pretty special night for the team. That's it for us here on The National for March 25th. Have a good night.